Hey guys, you're listening to the Tasha Labs podcast, and today I have something really special. If you heard the previous episodes, you know I talk a lot about how tokenization can help companies drive growth, right? But a pet peeve of mine about the current Web three landscape is we don't we don't actually have a lot of sustainable projects that are Web three native, right? So uh, the a pitfall of most of the Metaverse native projects today is that token itself end up being the product because the projects themselves don't have the good product that people actually want to buy. So that is a huge challenge that I see in the industry today. And、uh, if you heard my previous episodes, you know that one of my thesis for the next stage of development for Web three is that I think the Web two point five applications that combine the Web three business model with Web two type of products that actually have a real use case is going to help drive the next leg of adoption for the Web three economy. So today we have a very special conversation because I invited two founders of Sweatcoin, which is a massively successful consumer product with tokenization, but really grounded in the real economy. They started in. 2016, and、uh, they have grown to over 120 million users worldwide. Which, when I first heard about it, was like, "What? A Web3 project has 100 million users? How did that happen?" But the thing is, if you are a crypto native person, you probably heard very, very little about them. If your universe is crypto Twitter or any kind of crypto native media, because They had a very different growth strategy and customer base compared to most of the Web3 native products today. I call them the most successful Web3 company that nobody heard about. Today we are going to talk about their business model, their growth strategy, their token structure, and so on and so forth. So I think if you are a founder that's building a Web3 product, this conversation is going to be really, really useful to you. And if you are a investor, it's also going to be a super helpful conversation for you to think about where Web3 will be going in coming years. But keep in mind, the conversations I have on this podcast are for your own information gathering. Okay, so I ask questions. To founders that a potential investor or advisor would and should ask to founders, and none of this is financial advice. All right. So disclaimers out of the way. Let's get started. Hey, Anton Oleg, welcome to Tasha Labs, and congratulations on the huge token launch happened in September. I know that was a big month for your project. Thank you, Tasha. Thank you, Thank you very much for having us. Yeah. So.、Uh, Tell us briefly what is Sweatcoin and how does it work. Perhaps I'll start off and just you know out- outlining the purpose and the reason for existence. So we kicked off the company and we launched our product in 2016 with a very simple purpose to inspire a healthy planet by unlocking the value of.、Money. So literally, we knew that our way of making people more active will always revolve around a, a, a token, around a value concept of physical activity. And what we are creating is what we call a sweat economy. It's an open economy of movement, and an integral part of it is creating a new form or new generation currency that is generated by physical activity and literally used by a billion people. So you you your product is in the category that crypto native people will call move to earn. So basically. <laughs> You, you,、uh, because I, I'm a user. So, if, if if I go out for a walk or for a run, I earn some sweat coins. So,、uh, you know, I, I, I would say like most people when they first heard about this, they they would think this is a wacky idea. You pay people to walk. How does that even make sense? So, where, like, a, where, where where does this idea even come from? Like, what what made you think this could be a viable business? That's well, a great I mean, question. Like, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Oleg.、Um, we started thinking about it、uh, so 2014, 2015, and it was a personal problem. Like you know,、uh, I used to climb some of the highest mountains in the world. I mean, me and Anton climbed Kilimanjaro together, and、uh, you know, kind of few years down the line, 
having two young children and, you know, startup that perished in very unfortunate circumstances, I couldn't even complete 5K run. And we started talking, how is that possible that, you know, I lost so much fitness in such a short period of time? And we quickly realized that it's a universal problem. Everyone wants to be more active, no matter if you are training for a marathon, you still want to train more. And if you are depressed sitting at home with a bottle of beer in front of TV, you want to be more physically active. So we started thinking, how is it possible that every single person has the same problem? And we very quickly realized that the explanation is simple. Nature does not want you to be active. Nature did not build you to be active. Nature built you to survive, which means that you need to preserve calories rather than squandering them on being fit. So nature created us to be really careful with the uh, with calories, and it gave us this behavioral feature or bug called present bias. There's only one way to deal with present bias is through instant gratification. Once we've realized what the problem was, it was just a little bit of you know, sort of creativity, and we realized that we want to reward people for every basic bite of physical activity, which is step, to turn the relationship into a gainful activity. So rather than looking at step as something that expends calories, which nature doesn't want you to do, to gainful activity, we all of a sudden realized that people were 20% more active. So you know, kind of that's how the whole business came about. And this is what a lot of businesses that tried to follow in our wake uh, did not understand. They were just sort of building apps, but they didn't have very, very deep psychological kind of uh, internalized understanding. What was the problem they were solving? What they needed to give to the user in order to solve that problem? And I'm really proud to say that, you know, kind of the medical grade research that we've done with the uh, Warwick University showed that you know people are 20% more active after installing Sweatcoin than, than they were before. Yeah, so that's great. That's a really important point that you brought up that you know, as an application, you need to solve a problem for the users. And uh, most of the new projects, they don't have a clear understanding of what pro- what problem they're actually solving for users. But that's only, yeah. you know. One side of the coin, the other side is you're not a charity, right? So you're a business. So you, how did you think about uh, this business? How would this business make make money when you had this idea of uh, paying people to walk? So we'll Anton, probably, wanna... yeah. yeah. So, I mean, what it, the, the business is based on what we call Sweatcoin Flywheel. And the relationship is very clear. There's a promise of an asset that has some value. That promise attracts users, users get engaged. And that engagement produces two very valuable assets in it. You know, firstly, it's attention in and by itself. And secondly, people become more active. And those two assets, greater amount of physical activity and greater amount of attention, they actually can be monetized. So the attention engagement we monetize through working with brands that want to get access to our user base because they this 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 is the way they make money. So those brands, as payment for working with us, they provide their products to us completely for free. We never subsidize anything. And on top of that, they pay us for featuring the product on the marketplace. So the products we get for free, we pass them on to the user. So essentially, the value of that product goes back into the value of the asset, thus increasing that value. And that makes the asset even more attractive. So we create a flywheel. Now, the secondary cycle there is when you translate engagement to physical activity, that physical activity uh, uplift is extremely attractive to healthcare providers and insurers. Just to give you an example, we have a massive multi-year project working with the NHS, National Healthcare System in the UK. These guys struggle with curbing the costs of diabetes too. So 11% of the total budget goes into diabetes too. The best way to prevent people from developing diabetes too is running them through a pre-diabetes uh, a diabetes prevention program. The trouble with the existing program is that it has very low con- uh, retention, very low completion rate, 27%. When sweat coins at play, that number goes up from 27 to 87%. So NHS, essentially, what they do, they fund an additional range of prizes that's only available 
to those users who participate. And that leads to an increased uh, physical activity of plus 40%. And users uh, and patients lose about six percent of their body weight in ten weeks. So these are two examples of monetization strategies. One is again engagement. The other one is physical activity. Okay, so this business, so your business, if I understand understand correctly, you're right now you're monetizing two types of uh, value. One is the user's attention when they're using yeah. the application. And this is something valuable to the brands who want to advertise. And the other is uh, increased activity level, which is valuable to like uh, health authorities of, of, a, uh, of a public sector or a government. Correct. So, sure. yes. So um, when, you, when you first started, like what, what are the first things that you, that you did? to get this uh, project off the ground. <laughs> Great. All yeah, they started uh, using wireframes. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> um, very good question. Um, I think that we covered part of it already. We've spent quite a bit of time not building, but really dwelling on the problem and the definition of the problem. And I think that that made uh, that increased chances of success tremendously because I, I'm i talking to a lot of startups and a lot of founders and I can see this sort of happening time and time again. People are not starting their business with a problem in mind, but they're starting their business with idea in mind. And then they build, 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 they build a product and then they start looking for a problem that this project, that their, that their product solves. And that is a very, very difficult place to be. We went from exactly opposite. We really spent quite a bit of time on problem. We started talking to a lot of people that ended up being really interested in solving the problem because even first money that we picked up were, you know, result of a conversation when I described to a, you know, one of our first investors what we're trying to do that we are trying to make people more physically active and put nudges into their day-to-day -day life and make sure that their step count per day is increasing. And the guy had a pedometer watch and he was very, very kind of interested in this whole health and fitness. And he was also very concerned about the accuracy of his watch because, you know, kind of every time he was lifting a beer or lifting a phone, it was counting as steps. And he was... Kind of, he asked me, so how are you going to solve this problem? And you know, I just said, look, lots of users, verification. We're going to need to to build patterns, etc. And he said, okay, problem is great. You know, you understand the issue of accuracy of data. And he put in first check. So focusing on the problem was one thing. The, the next thing we've done is building. You know, as Anton said, we pulled together wireframes. We found an external uh, provider and the builder of an app. We built a very, very ugly, horrible, rudimentary app that then went to testing with like a couple of hundred people. And we realized that we were onto something because people were excited. They were interested. There was a lot of engagement. And, uh, you know, kind of on the back of that, we raised big around and built an app that you, you know, well, the app that is become what you are using right now. Um, yeah. So, so, so you had on the problem and the product. So you had a, a MVP, a minimum viable product. You tested on a, a couple hundred people and then you take that data and you look for funding. Is that the sequence? Yes. Okay. How did you find that a couple hundred people? Everyone knows a couple of hundred people. I mean, if you were <laughs> developing a product, I'm sure that you would find, I don't know, a couple of million people to test. So, you know, 200 people, anyone can find friends and family because, you, you know, that that's honestly what we did. Like, mm. we're working on this. Can you install it? Can you, you know, can you do X, Y, and Z? Can you tell me what you think? So I was spending shit loads of time talking to people who were using our app and getting feedback in the beginning, it was bad. We started fixing bits and bits and bits and but um, and slowly, it well slowly actually so rather rapidly. I think that within so three months, we started seeing that it was getting really really positive feedback, and people started asking, "Can I get my you know my girlfriend, my friend?" You know, and all of a sudden we had 
people who we knew were bringing in more testers to us. So how did you get the first batch of uh, like serious users though? That that would actually be like count as meaningful metrics. <laughs> oh, it's a, it's, a, it's a funny one. So uh, we, we actually did the first prototype, which was, as Oleg as like said, was horrible. Then we actually ended up you know, getting uh, upgraded in a team, we found our you know third co-founder, who is our CTO. We started building, and then we released the app to App Store. And all I got that day, he was talking at a conference, and I was boarding a plane to San Francisco. And he was kind of, yeah, yeah I'm going to announce the launch of the of the uh, of the app, and then you know maybe somebody is going to write about it. I think they lined up a couple of mentions, and so he. He wished me a good flight, and then next thing I know, I landed. I look into the app. There's thirty thousand users. So that took off like a wildfire. But then, as you always do, you know, after a while, it just flattened out. But that gave us that first original like five, ten thousand users to experiment with. And then, you know, for the next you know few months, we experimented with that user base, trying to understand what works, what doesn't. The, key question to us was to understand whether it actually delivered what we promised because you know whether it's just a game or people do indeed change their behavior and become more active and when we saw that it was the latter there was yeah fine so the, the product delivers how do we grow them so we felt that we are you know the product was there the growth wasn't so the next challenge was how do we find a growth uh, recipe or the growth engine so the the first uh, you said uh, thirty forty thousand user uh, users are they from UK or like wh where are they? Yeah, UK, okay. UK. That was the UK launch. So um, once you get the initial users, did you have like merchants or advertisers on board right away? And what what's the thinking that in that front? Yeah, double sided marketplaces are tricky. Oops, so I lost you. Oh, like hello, can't hear you. Yes, yes. we can hear you. Not good. Sorry. Yeah. Um, Double-sided marketplaces are quite tricky. So what was happening in parallel were a lot of conversations with brands and companies uh, that were interested in users. With 30,000 users, we started talking to small brands that were interested in one or two or 3,000 uh, kind of new users for them. And, you know, it was tricky. But we were very lucky. We had our first employee um, who joined us at uh, at the time. He really uh, kind of productized this whole outreach and helped us to build a very very strong pitch for brands. And you know, kind of it continues to uh, to work to this day. We now work with more than six hundred companies. Uh, Anton, you probably took closer to the exact numbers. Yeah. Uh, that accept Sweatcoin or put sort of products in the Sweatcoin marketplace uh, right now. So if I'm a business business and I need users, obviously I'm always looking for new channels to advertise, but what would your pitch to me when I'm trying to consider, okay, do I advertise on Sweatcoin or put up like a Google, Facebook ads and uh, what's the additional attractiveness for me? So you get a user that's essentially a pre-prime, that's a user that's interested in your product already. And uh, we would take it upon ourselves to make sure that, you know, our we would only work with brands that would be attractive to our users and therefore the, the users would have a higher levels of conversion for brands. So we were a very efficient channel. So does that mean like uh, being like a specific type of brands, like maybe catering to people? Yeah, who want we to be started healthier? off. We started off with, you know, a very clear proposition. We are all around health. And, you know, to many, uh, Sweatcoin at the time was almost like a product discovery platform that would discover new cool brands that were looking for a new way to grow. And we obviously, we didn't start with the Nikes and Reebok of this world because we were way too small. But there was plenty of brands that were just trying to take off. They didn't need uh, tens of thousands of users they would be perfectly happy to get 100 users, which we had. So, you know, the two-sided marketplace, the cold start problem that I think that you mentioned uh, once or twice, it's a really important one. So we managed to get the initial user base through the promise. Then we've delivered products to them. And as the user base continued to grow, 
we did increase the size of the of the brands and the, the reach that they required. And then at some point in time, because our original decision, product decision, was that we were not an Amazon. It's not an endless list of products that you can choose from. Uh, at, the, at the beginning, we only had four slots for products displayed every single day. And then we would rotate. We would introduce a new product every day, maybe sometimes uh, every couple of days. And that created a little bit of scarcity. And then, you know, before we knew it, all of a sudden, we just realized that some brands were kind of, oh, we can't really feature you until, you know, same day in two months. So that's created a little bit of scarcity. And then it was much easier for us to actually pick and choose the brands that we really wanted to work with. I think from what I hear, a really important point here is that when you're starting small, you want to like strategically choose your partners, the business partners that maybe like on a sim- similar scale as you, instead of uh, hoping to get right. Nike or Amazon in the world. So uh, how, do, how do businesses pay you? Is that like a pay for click or what, what kind of uh, payment regime? There's a, bunch, there's a bunch of different ways. It could be a CPA, could be a revenue share. Uh, then again, we also have ads that are done in a very clever way. These are rewarded videos. So we source ads from different uh, brands and uh, we display them to a user. If the user watches the ad, they get one sweat coin. That was a pretty cool hack for us. It still works really well. So there's a bunch of different models, but they're all around the kind of the performance based, the affiliate type of models there. And once you get initial, you know, you, a bunch of users, uh, I know a lot of products, they, they like a plateau after a while, you know, uh, but mm-hmm. how do you get, 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 get over that, that, that hump? Well, it happened so, multiple yeah. times, mm-hmm. you know, kind of the, this, uh, uh, if somebody shows you the straight line growth, that's, you know, that's probably just a chunk because it always is, there is a burst of growth, then you plateau. And, you know, you consolidate and then you look for your next source of uh, growth. I think that we've probably gone through about three or four of these uh, um, already. And the answer is uh, always the same. You need to, you know, kind of hone down and perfect your product and spend even more time with your users to see where is the next product or feature uh, that, uh, is in need or uh, like we've done uh, over the last few years is what is the next market that we're going to double down on and enter because um, you know for a very long time we were only available in a handful of European markets US and Canada and we were you know it took us some time to develop a playbook and figure out how to enter into uh, kind of into other markets. I'm sure that Anton uh, can add a lot of color to this. Yeah, so on the growth side, I think it's a number of hacks that we deployed, which were then stacking up uh, on each other. So the first one was really uh, when we came up with this idea, a really clever idea of a referral program where we would actually end up paying with sweat coins rather than cash. So every single user installs a sweat coin app, they get the idea, they end up on a home screen with a zero balance. And you only have two ways to earn extra sweat coins. One is to start walking. The other one is to invite a friend and to get five sweat coins for a confirmed uh, invite that's, you know, that a user that started walking. So that was the first hack that uh, immediately gave us some additional uh, dry powder because we, you know, all of a sudden we've created a product that was quite viral. And then every time you come up with a new hack, uh, like, for example, our next hack was to leverage mid-size influencers and small-size influencers, because at that stage, there was uh, early 2017, I believe. Um, you know, if you were an influencer with like 10,000 or maybe 50,000 or even 100,000 followers, it was pretty damn hard to make any money out of it. And we, you know, we spotted that and we managed to get to work with them and then we created a, a next version of the experience because, you know, when you are a, a regular user, you invited two or three friends, you would get five sweat coins for each. But then when you invited more than 30 friends, you, you know, a secret marketplace would open up and you'd be able to monetize it in a, in a different way, in a more advanced way. So 
We then added influencers. And then, as Oleg said, we added a few other hacks. And right now, every time we only about uh, the only about 25 to 35% of our users are paid for. A vast majority of all that growth that you mentioned is actually viral or organic. And that's a lot of help because every time we, you know, when we acquire a new user, even if it's a paid user, then this user invites a bunch of friends. So there's almost like a tail off and that creates a very sustainable uh, unit economics. You know, our LTV to CAC ratio is four to one, which is extremely sustainable. So that's very, very interesting. So what I hear you're saying is uh, right now you're also trying to expand into to more geographical areas, more countries, right? Correct. So uh, how do you ex- expand to a new market? Because you, you, I, I assume you would need to connect with uh, local merchants specifically catering to that market as well. Yes and and no, because a lot of our merchants or uh, vendors, as we call them, they're actually global, especially the digital subscriptions and uh, this you know businesses like that. So we always have a fairly good and fairly fairly deep uh, offering in terms of global uh, uh, merchants. And then, of course, before you launch into a sizable market, you always do some prep work. It usually takes us four to six weeks to create some inventory of uh, offers. And then when you start and when you typically, we grow quite fast, whenever we launch into a new market, we acquire a considerable number of users pretty early because we're so viral. And that really helps a lot with the further acquisition of the local local event base. So in terms of uh, distribution of user base, uh, can you just like, uh, in terms of rough numbers, uh, where, where are most of the users? The largest user bases have always been the U.S. We then started to scale internationally uh, towards the end of last year, early this year. So we have, we have major pockets of users in the U.S., Europe. We have a big user base in the Middle East. And then we launched in Latin America, which was a complete nuclear explosion uh, in May and June of this year. So we became the biggest uh, app in Brazil overall, not just health and fitness category, but our overall, I think at the peak, our daily registrations reached uh, like 3 million. That was insane. So right now we have a sizable presence in Latin America too, including Central America. We are still not as active in places like uh, Southeast Asia. We are not launched in China. We are pretty rudimentary in India. We are launching Indonesia next week. So watch the space and then India to follow later on in the year. So in terms of uh, numbers of active users, can you give us some numbers of uh, how, how many users and uh, what, what's the, yeah. So last month we had 25 million now. Active and, users. Uh, I, yes, active users, correct. So I wouldn't be able to give you a breakdown by geography, but this is fairly balanced at the moment. Yes, yes. That, that's that's a very impressive. So. Obviously, it's uh, um, you just launched into uh, uh, on-chain token. You just issued a, a, a fungible token on the near blockchain in September, um, which is uh, amazing because uh, most of Web3 projects, they issue token from day one. And uh, Sweatcoin has been a wall garden for all these years that you've been in operation. So what's the thinking there? Why didn't you issue a tradable token from day one? Very very good question. We wanted to. So as name with coin suggests, we were already thinking of being on blockchain back in 2015 when, you know, kind of we started thinking about this problem. Because if you remember our problem definition, we needed to give people rewards for steps. So our thinking was, let's have a crypto token that you will be, you know, that will be backed by the value of your physical activity. Unfortunately, you know, back in 2015, there was only Bitcoin that was in production. We also met with Vitalik and discussed the then uh, research-grade project called Ethereum, uh, but it was a bit too early. And, uh, you know, we decided that we will go centralized um, just to see how MVP performs. And as we mentioned to you, we very, very quickly started scaling and we literally, by early 2017, we were already processing several hundred transactions per second at peak. So 
all of a sudden the idea of sort of building on blockchain was no longer viable. Why we wanted to build on blockchain rather than just issue a token is because our vision was to create a currency backed by the value of physical activity, not create a token and then try to pump whatever value we can find uh, into it because that's sort of putting carriage before the horse. And if you properly build our business on blockchain, then it means that the issuance or creation of a token needs to happen on chain on the back of the received and verified and confirmed physical activity, which means that, you know, it needs to process, you know, back in 2017, several hundred transactions per second at peak. We couldn't do that. There was no technology very much until last year when we finally saw near Algorand, Solana and lots of other projects arriving with a lot higher throughputs, a lot higher speeds, a lot lower energy consumption because as you would imagine, we as a project, we're focusing on burning calories as opposed to electricity or fossil fuels. You know, and you know, for us, it was very important to make sure that we're building on a chain that is energy efficient. So, uh, pause, uh, proof of, uh, proof of stake. And, you know, kind of that basically what happened in September is that our original vision has finally materialized. And what we end up having are two currencies. Sweat coin is Think of it as a sort of points system that we already had for the last seven, eight years. And they continue existing and you can continue using them in our health and fitness app called Sweatcoin. We've created another asset, which is called Sweat Token. That's why you see different logos. I'm wearing Sweat. Anton wears Sweatcoin. So they are like sister projects. Sweatcoin is top of the funnel health and fitness, engagement, data tracking, and SWAT is the end result for those people that opted into play crypto game, first 5,000 steps every day can be converted into SWAT, and SWAT wallet that went live at the same time as our TGE on the 12th of September is your sort of center of your crypto life. You know, can we are rapidly developing it and it will evolve into effectively a super crypto app over time that will have your sweat as well as all other crypto holdings that you might decide to have in the future that's very and very overall, interesting the whole, yes and overall the whole thing tashi is that this is called sweat economy this is the open economy of movement that we set out to create now it has a web two side has a web three side in wallet, and then it has this sweat token, which is a crypto asset. Yeah, I want to dive more deeper into the whole tokenomics uh, for 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 both the sweat coin and the uh, sweat wallet. But let's just say, you know, you you you've done like a few years of uh, tr- you've had a tremendous uh, success with the sweat coin without having a tradable token, right? Not secondary market tradable. It's only you can you redeem products in in the in the application. Do you think do you think things could have would have gone differently if you had a tradable token from day one? How 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 would things uh, have gone differently? Or I guess more directly, my take, question is: uh, Can I take do, you, this? do you think it's it would a be a blessing or a answer. curse? <laughs> it's a very it would be a very simple answer uh, because we want to create currency that is the expression of the unit of physical activity value. It would be very difficult to first create the token and then try to put physical activity into it. It needs to be born out of physical activity. So it would have been a very, very different project. And I know that a lot of businesses go down that path. I cannot really pass judgment. Would it be better or worse? But it would be a very different thing. We want to make sure that in the future, when people see price of sweat, they think this is the price that the world puts on physical activity. And if it goes up and down, you know, kind of the conversation is, it's not that sweat changed the price. The 
value of physical activity has gone up or has gone down because our mission is to make the world more physically active. We want to create this unit of currency that will be the center that will power this movement economy, the sweat economy, because we know that your physical activity has value. You know, you seem to be, you know, quite fit looking, right? So we know when you're fit, you're going to live longer, you're more productive, you are in better mood, you know, your family values your physical activity, your doctor values your physical activity, your insurer values your physical activity, your employer values your physical activity, your country <coughs> values your physical activity because you're going to live longer and you're going to create more tax revenues all the time, right? So because there is an immense amount of value created by making the world more physically active, we would like to power all of these transactions that currently exist only you know, kind of in words. You know, for example, insurers know that physical activity or people who are physically active is better risk, right? Now, with advent of our token, all of a sudden, insurers will be able to take part of the price in sweat and give you a significant discount. You know, we hope that in the future, governments will take part of your taxes at the end of the year in sweat. Because that means that you are, you know, less, you know, you're putting less pressure on healthcare uh, system, your costs are lower, you're going to live longer, you're going to generate higher uh, tax revenues overall over your lifetime. That's uh, Natasha, really the second part. Second, second part of the answer is very simple. So, I mean, where we are based, you know, the value of the token should come from somewhere. Mm. In our case, the value of the token comes from the revenue that we generate. Essentially, we put back that revenue into the value of the token. And when we just started, that value was coming in kind. We would just essentially put back the value of products available in exchange for sweat coins into the value of the token. Uh, but so before you've established that loop, before you've established a way to create value and put it back into the system, you know, the, the, the actual value of the token would be just speculative. And we'd always focused on the fundamental part of the value. So I think that it was a blessing that we weren't able to launch the crypto asset because, you know, if we had it launched, then the time that we were figuring, figuring things out you know, the value of that asset probably would be close to zero and that wouldn't let us take it off the ground. So we had a bit of a luxury of a, you know, a little bit of time. We bought a little bit of time, figured out the monetization channels, which are extrinsic to the user. So to speak, it's our job to generate value, put it back into the value of the token. And then, you know, we, we run a profitable business with Sweatcoin. It means that we managed to create lots of value repeatedly and put it back into the value of the token. And that still leaves us enough money to invest into growth and reinvest into growth and things like that. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I think, uh, you know, a lot of Web3 projects are really putting the car before the horse because, uh, you know, when you have a reflexive financial cycle in a crypto market, uh, your token price goes up, doesn't mean that your product is getting better. And for founders, uh, it's actually getting mixed signals or getting a lot of noise from the market. Oh, your token price goes up must mean that like, uh, people like, like your product or want to buy your product, which is not the case at all. So I, I think, you know, an analogy I would use is like when athletes are training, you kind of put sandbags on your legs and when you, when you're training to run, right? A, a Additional resistance that helps you to train when you in the actual race, you actually perform better. So I want to talk about uh, the sweat economy. I want to, you know, talk about more in more details, this transition into Web3. Okay. So obviously you had a huge token launch. Uh, can you tell us, uh, because I, 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 I read about the, your you kind of a transaction volume is uh, uh, pretty big from day one. Can you give us some numbers? Very good question. Um, we have 3 million active wallets uh, right now. Unfortunately, I don't have on my, uh, kind of on my fingertips the, uh, the numbers of uh, transactions, but it should be in our token that anyone can look at. Uh, the token contract on near is token.sweat. 
um, you know, if you want, I can send a link and you can uh, attach it to your sort of publications. People can do their analysis and view absolutely everything on, on uh, chain pretty much in real time. But one thing it's a funny one, is... Tasha, because we never, neither Oleg nor me, we don't know the actual volume. We don't really care that much about it. And neither do we care about the token price that much. I mean, we know that the token price is not zero. That's great. Uh, but at the end of the day, what really matters is the number of active users. Exactly. If you get users who are excited, who are continuing to use your product, and over time, other things will get into place. So we don't really care about the trading volumes that much and, uh, and, and the token price. Okay, so just to fill yeah. in some gap here, I think the last number I read, okay, from one of your investor updates, it's uh, about the eighty percent of the total transaction volumes on near blockchain in September came from uh, the 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 sweat economy, sweat wallet. Okay, yeah. so um, I'm sure that number has has changed, but just to give people a a rough idea <laughs> of I the mean, we're definitely by far the largest project on near by a long mile. I also believe that we're probably, you know, kind of if you think about the age of our token, which is what, two, less than three weeks, I'm sure that, you know, kind of if you're talking about three weeks old token, we probably are the widest held asset out there. Because yeah. it would be just shy of 14 million uh, wallets will have some quantity of sweat in them. So it's, you know, kind of, it basically gives us huge user base to activate. As Anton absolutely rightly said, if there is one metric that we are focusing on right now, it is active wallets. We want people to engage with their sweat. We want them to try all the different products starting from staking or we call it grow jars because staking as a term is not necessarily sort of mass market or for non-crypto natives, staking is, is, is very cryptic. So we've developed uh, or we're using, you know, more understandable lingo, a lot simpler UX to engage our users into, you know, basically discovering all the different things they can do with SWAT. And over the next two to three years, we have a very aggressive roadmap introducing a lot of new functionalities and a lot of new ways of uh, uh, our users utilizing the sweat that they have on their balances. So talk about user engagement. Uh, can you tell us uh, how this uh, new sweat wallet app functions similarly or differently uh, from the sweat coin model? Yeah, it's a very different application. Um, the way we think about it is Sweatcoin is your health and fitness hub. This is where your steps reside. This is uh, you know, kind of the, the starting point for our uh, movement validation uh, system. And Sweat Wallet is, as it says in the name, is more of a crypto wallet application. So there is very little there um, around your step count today. Uh, you know, we're not trying to kind of mix the two because combining um, crypto and fin financial services application together with health and fitness is a little sort of step too far for quite a lot of uh, people. It doesn't mean that it might not happen in the future, but at the moment, they are very, very different. And they also reside in different categories in, you know, in App Store. You know, Swift Wallet is in finance and Swift Coin is in health and fitness. And the main functionalities there are, of course, you can see your current holdings, you can see the history of transactions, etc. And uh, then there are a lot of exciting things that you can already do, despite the fact that, you know, it's only two and a half weeks old product. You can stake your sweat to earn interest into what we call grow jars. And depending on the um, length for uh, over period that you prepared to lock your sweat for, you are earning progressively higher return. Then you can, of course, send and receive sweat. And you know a lot of people are using this functionality to send sweat around to other users, but also to and from exchanges um, uh, where they, you know, some people sell, some people buy sweat, and they add it to their kind of sweat wallet balance 
so that they can do other exciting things uh, with it. From yesterday, so actually uh, from very early today, you can now add sweat with the use of uh, credit card. So, you know, there is a very sort of rapid on-ramp. And we're glad to say that, you know, there is already quite a lot of usage of, uh, uh, of that functionality. And we have a very, very aggressive roadmap that, uh, um, you know, soon we're going to have NFTs, um, which we are, you know, kind of putting quite a lot of effort into developing and very, very exciting dynamic NFTs that will be representation of your activity, physical as well as engagement with the app. Um, you know, will create unique uh, resulting sort of image and uh, uh, NFT that will be representing you in the kind of sweat coin ecosystem. A lot more, of course, trading, um, so integration of taxes and ability to swap sweat for um, other tokens, off-ramping, and ultimately, uh, we, over time, as we decentralize, what we would like to do is to enable you to monetize your physical activity data. Uh, at the moment, being a largely centralized entity, we do not do anything with the data we collect. We feel that it's inappropriate because the data is yours. And in the future, as we decentralize, we will be able to transfer the ownership of this data to DAO and you as a data creator and as a token holder, will be able to decide, I want to expose my data for analytics. And we know that this is extremely valuable information, like levels of physical activity and the changes and fluctuations, like when COVID started and Spain um, uh, started their very, very draconian lockdown, we saw almost in sort of real time, that 85% of all physical activity has disappeared in Spain. Having this information, you can predict, you know, increase in healthcare costs and, you know, increase in population weight, et cetera, et cetera. So this data is extremely valuable and is not available from any other source. So in the future, you will be able to make your data analyzable and you will be generating bulk of the revenue from all of these analytics with DAO or the platform taking a cut to sort of distribute uh, this value to all the token holders. So as uh, Anton mentioned uh, at the beginning of the episode, that the values uh, come from the activities are really user attention and then the value of the physical activities. How do these values translate to into the token price of for sweat token? What's the, how does that value loop work? Very good question. So, you know, kind of think of it as a, uh, well, the way I think about it is like a startup. Um, in order for a startup to be successful, you first invest and then you get the return. So think of value of attention as a kind of initial stage, as a bootstrapping of the token to make sure that over time it can become more and more dependent and therefore field by the value of physical activity. The data that I've just described is, you know, kind of one of those very, very big revenue streams that will be generating value for the token holders in the long run. Right now, it is attention advertising, etc. that goes, you know, kind of goes in. Over time, we're going to be adding more and more um, directly or uh, revenue streams directly linked to physical activity. Another one to give you an example um, would be alternative oracle, uh, alternative oracles or turn alternative movement validators. So we specialize in steps. There are a lot of businesses out there that, you know, do tracking of swimming, cycling, you know, high intensity training, CrossFit, etc., And these businesses are very interested in partnering with us and potentially issuing sweat to their users on the back of this activity. In order for that to happen, they will be running an alternative oracle. And in order to run that oracle, they'll need to stake quite a lot of sweat to make sure that there is a, you know, kind of uh, incentive not to, you know, spam the network and not to send, you know, kind of game data. And 
this is yet another significant demand driver for SWAT and the revenue generator that is directly linked to value of physical activity that will then be funneled into the value of the token. So if you think about the evolution of the value, we're starting and bootstrapping with attention. And with time, it is becoming more and more dependent on movement related revenue streams. That's and in great. practical terms, that's, that means that we will essentially, we are re redistributing uh, the value, the revenue we generate back into the user, either in things like uh, uh, staking yield or buy and burn, where we just, you know, simply, uh, uh, this, is the, this is our way of putting that value back into the system. So, so if I understand correctly, like today, you are mostly monetizing the attention. And the way to monetize attention is that uh, you have brands and advertisers uh, who will buy the sweat token in order to become an advertiser on the platform. Is that right? They, they don't necessarily have to do that. We can do that on their behalf. But in principle, that is the right way of doing this. Yes. So they want to be part of our platform. For that, they pay, whether it's cash or fiat or, or sweat. It's less relevant. The most important thing is that this value coming in. And that value we will put back into the system so that the old users of the ecosystem can benefit. Okay, so the advertisers, brands pay you and uh, either directly or indirectly that trans translates into buying of sweat, to sweat tokens. And some of the buying will support the token price, obviously. And uh, some of the buying, you will buy that token and give to users as a yields. Is that right? Uh, most of it is actually going to be burned. Correct. And some of it will go into yield. So basic idea is that it will reduce circulating supply and therefore the value of the token in the long run. So, I mean, the way we're thinking about uh, our business in Web3 is we were able to achieve quite a lot, get to massive scale and uh, become profitable in health and fitness with a point system or with a token that is centralized, that is inflationary, and that has very limited utility. Now, in Web3, we have decentralized token. We have you know, an ability to run tokenomics that it becomes deflationary over time, and it's completely open to be accepted absolutely anywhere where crypto is accepted. And in addition, Web3 gives us opportunity to generate additional revenue streams that could not exist in Web2. Data, alternative movement validators, just an example. Trading, you know, kind of trading fees to, you know, to enable swapping of different, uh, of sweat for different other tokens, you know, on-ramp, off-ramp. All of these revenue streams were not accessible to us in Web2. So it is a bigger business with a lot more revenue streams and a lot better unit economics as a result. And if you have a healthy business that is profitable, then no matter if it's Web2 or Web3, that is going to result in you know, kind of all the uh, token holders uh, having a very, very good outcome. So do you think this makes any difference to brands who want to advertise uh, on the platform, whether the token is tradable or uh, walled garden? Does that make a difference to the brands? Depends on the brand. If you're a just a regular, like for example, you're a pet food brand or a healthy, uh, healthy food brand or something, probably it doesn't. But when you're a specific Web three project, then of course it, you know, and you all of a sudden you get access to a a highly valuable, you know, three million active users in our wallet. That's a completely different story altogether. So it's all about uh, uh, segmenting the user base. And you cannot just, you know, apply the same approach to every single brand. It's just, you know, all brands are different and some of them will appreciate the fact that crypto and some of them won't. So uh, what portion of the sweat coin a user base have converted, uh, so to speak, in, into the sweat token? What we are seeing right now is uh, about 20 to 30% of all new users 
they want to opt in into crypto, which means that in addition to all the perks and all the user experience they get with Sweatcoin, they will also have Sweat. Mm -hmm. And then on average, that's approximately the, the proportion of the active users that we got converted who decided to opt in to, to have a uh, crypto, uh, crypto leg, so to speak. Uh, why, why do you think the rest of the uh, people haven't opted in? Uh, um, it seems like a no-brainer value proposition. You can sell your tokens now. That only says one thing. Not everybody is aware of crypto. Mm. It's a funny one because uh, we, because we are called Sweatcoin and because this concept is pretty kind of close to move to earn, we don't get like somebody who is completely oblivious about health or fitness or like the idea of monetizing or doing something. So we already pre-primed users who are more likely to know about crypto, at least understand it. But even of those users that we get, not everybody is interested in crypto. And it's perfectly fine. Like we actually expect that percent, that conversion rate to gradually uh, uh, increase as time goes by, uh, people and crypto becomes an everyday thing, but it's not. It's a very niche product still. It's a very niche uh, industry. You know, for internet, it took, you know, more than 10 years to take over. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a normal thing. Do, do you think it has something to do with also the uh, geographical coverage? Because, for example, right now in the U.S., Sweat Wallet app is not, uh, you know, open. So For sure. I have a sweat sure. point application, but I cannot use the wallet. So what's the point of conversion? For sure, specifically. So all that 20 to 30% range, I'm, uh, we are excluding the markets that we classify as unlaunched because it's very, very important for us that we are whiter than white in terms of regulator. And whenever we don't feel that there's enough kind of clarity and there's some gray area, like in the US, for example, we made a very conscious decision not to launch there just to make sure that we don't uh, break any whatever rules or step over any red lines. And in the US, clearly, there's red lines that are extremely fuzzy at the moment. So yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, there are some countries that you know where, where product is simply unavailable. But even in those, and, and there are some countries where you know crypto has a high propensity. Like, you know, for example, we see lots of new users in Japan being very interested in crypto much more so than a elsewhere. We see certain markets like the Philippines, for example, rightly so, I mean, because of Axie, Infinity, um, that are very interested. And then there are some other markets that are relatively less interested. But over time, I think that's going to even out. So wh which are the top countries that has the highest conversions right now? Uh, uh, Japan, mm -hmm. Ukraine, uh, the United Kingdom, uh, European countries have pretty high conversions as well. That's great. So in terms of the U.S., I, obviously, I live in the U.S., and then I, I wish you would launch in the U.S. from day one. So what, what would it take for, for you to launch in the U.S.? That is something that we are working on, and this is a very serious undertaking. We are working with our investors. We are working with our advisors, and we are watching the, uh, the space very, very closely. We would love to be able to launch in the U.S. We will launch in the U.S. one day. But because we have a fiduciary responsibility to our current shareholders, and we just need to, and we also to our users, most importantly, because we've got, uh, we've got lots to lose if we do something wrong. Uh, so we will only go there when we're 100% you know, sure that everything's kosher and, uh, and in line with the regulator's uh, requirements. So it's not like you're 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 not allowed to launch in the U.S., but it's a precautionary on your side. Is 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 that correct? Correct. It's yes. too too much gray space at the moment. Yeah, because yeah. uh, you know you're like one of your comp competitors, for example, uh, Stepan. They are available in the in the U.S. Yeah. So so so, but but on your side, what what kind of clarity do do, do you think uh, you need? It's a so very good question. We, I think that it's yeah. not it's it's not that we know what kind of clarity we need. It is general sort of existence and clarity around what is allowed and not. And right now, basically, it's it's impossible to uh, to kind of understand what's going on because you know whatever questions you ask, the answer is no. It's uh, it's a very peculiar um, 
sort of situation as time passes. Well, I'm, I, you know, I'm sure I'm sure you've seen this uh, plenty of times. Uh, there are a lot of projects that are opting out uh, from launching in the U.S. just because uh, nobody really can uh, can give a clear sort of guidance. Is it okay? Is it not okay? And if you're starting to ask questions, then you need a lot of time, like you know, kind of incredible amount of time mm-hmm. that we simply did not have because that would push us into probably sort of a year more to uh, to get some clarity. And even then, we are not sure exactly what would you know, kind of what would be allowed and what wouldn't be. And the most important thing that because it's so uh, fluid and it changes so much, we'd like it to get somewhere where you know, kind of we we can be certain that what we're launching now is going to be okay in the kind of in the future. And right now, nobody mm-hmm. can give these guarantees. You mentioned Stepan. I think that um, you know, kind of they and their experience was. Uh, something that we were watching closely. You know that they also launched in China, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. And then they had to backtrack. Mm-hmm. And it was really, really painful. It was very, very difficult. And, you know, and they've gone through massive turmoil with their uh, ecosystem and with their community. We've opted not to launch in China or the US just because of this, to prevent you know, really negative, disruptive events after launch. And we would rather have a positive one, such as launch, as opposed to withdrawal from the market. Right, right. That makes sense. So uh, I, I want to go back to uh, tokenomics uh, uh, more for, for a sec. So when you launched the SWAT token, you, you, you said uh, the first 5,000 steps per day that you earn is what coin can be converted into the sweat token. And the t- sweat token has a like exponentially decreasing emission schedule. So it's uh, harder and harder to mint tokens uh, uh, going forward, right? So how do you decide those parameters? Why 5,000? Why not 6,000 or 3,000? And and those uh, parameters, have, like how, how did you come up with those numbers? <laughs> Shall we call it wisdom of crowds? Uh, there were a lot of conversations uh, in uh, kind of in house uh, around this, and we, you know, kind of it. It was done on balance to deliver the right token economics, the motivation for people to walk, but also taking into consideration the averages uh, that people are walking, because you know. We could potentially do 10,000, but the average walking, uh, for example, in the US where you are, is less than 4,000 steps. So that's not necessarily um, changing much mm-hmm. for majority of uh, can our users. Um, we, you know, can we basically put this as a starting point, because as you would imagine, as we decentralize, we are going to bring in more and more governance into uh, kind of into focus. And what I envision that if, for whatever reason, the number of five thousand steps in the future is not deemed to be optimal, we can easily go and change this parameter and turn it into a governance vote by the community. And if community says that you know it needs to be higher or it needs to be lower, it will be changed. Same thing with a minting formula, you know, kind of um, increasing or decreasing difficulty. Um, if we feel that emissions are too high or that motivation of users is starting to decline, then all of these parameters, again, through the governance mechanisms, will be changeable. So, so that that token minting schedule right now is a fixed schedule. So that means like, okay, so like right now I'm using the app and I'm minting a certain amount of token today. If tomorrow you launch into a huge market, I don't know, Indonesia or US, a whole bunch more people started minting tokens. That means uh, the, the the steps, uh, the the sweat uh, token I'll be able to mint each day will dramatically reduce. Is that right? 
it, it you know basically you will need to take more steps to get one sweat yes i see so but the thing that the thing that the the thing that the thing that the thing that the thing that the thing you know, as the size of the ecosystem grows, so does the the value that goes back into the ecosystem. So there's a very fine balancing act. You know, yes, you can convert, you have to convert more steps into sweat, but then you're part of a much bigger pie and your sweat is part of a much bigger pie because your ecosystem has grown that much. Right. So um, did, did you do any kind of price projections or token emission projections of, d d under different scenarios when, when, you, when you launch? Yes. Uh, not, not, not the price, because to be honest, price is extremely uh, difficult thing and probably a thankless task, to be honest, mm -hmm. to, um, to kind of to predict. But we definitely spend a lot of time on emissions and curves but as you would imagine um it's impossible uh, in our case to have it precisely forecasted because it's a function of number of users who are active the amount of walking that they take and these parameters are so sort of constantly changing and evolving so um yeah, I foresee that we, we we will be changing some of the parameters in tokenomics um, over time because you know as more people walk and we learn, um, you know, can we will we will be optimizing for specific kind of size of the market, market conditions, etc. And again, we will be definitely doing it in a very very transparent way involving the community. So you mentioned that uh, you, you, your vision is to for, for, for sweat token to become a currency that is backed by physical activities. So we know, we, we know that all the currencies in the world, or most fiat currencies, are issued by governments, and uh, governments have central banks to, to manage their currencies. And central banks have, you know, usually do like market interventions to stabilize their currency prices, and they have foreign reserves that to be used to um, do open market operations to you know, stabilize uh, their, their currency prices. Do you have something similar like that? Well, I mean, we have Treasury that mm. is sort of responsible for, um, you know, success of the project. So, you know, in short, yes. Uh, the longer version of the answer is we need to learn an awful lot because the nature of our project and the nature of our tokenomics is such that there is very little, there are very, very few precedents mm -hmm. that we can learn from because we're not like, you know, fixed supply, preminted. There are quite a lot of do's and don'ts and playbooks for projects like that. We're very, very different. So, you know, we're definitely taking this function on and we will be learning uh, a lot with the help of community in making sure that we are developing a uh, sweat economy for you know tens and hopefully hundreds possibly thousands of years uh, going forward right so because you you're the ones making history here so uh the other people will be learning from you <laughs> or looking to learn Thank from you. you so this is a very very exciting uh initiative uh, uh you know untreaded path uh that that you're taking um any kind of uh you know uh thoughts on lessons you learned from this journey that you've been on for several years which is very exciting uh any major things that that you learned as an entrepreneur that you didn't know before or anything about web3 that you didn't know before yeah maybe wow. i'll kick off the talk tokenization is a secret source that can change things that are ways that businesses go about doing what they do to me like tokenization and just a general concept is such a novel thing that's only come to light because right now there are working mechanisms and uh, uh, platforms that uh, enable that that's the first one the second one for me is uh how do you leverage growth and how do you unlock you know how you create a flywheel 
I think it's an extremely powerful, um, powerful tool if you're successful. So everybody, you know, lots been uh, said about the network uh, effects and stuff like that. Uh, you know, and obviously a flywheel exists when there's very strong network effects. But the problem is that it's not always, you know, of course, you're a Facebook or a social network, then the, the network effects, they are inbuilt in the nature of the product. But sometimes you can create those network effects and there's multiple different types of network effects. How do you design your system in such a way those different network effects, they kick in and they interact with each other? I think it's a really interesting concept and that's something that uh, you just need to execute well against. Um, finally, third thing is, you know, what really helps you scale is culture. When you have a very strong culture that you've established early on, then the rest is so much easier because you will have to go through downs and, you know, there'll be multiple black swans and there'll be, you know, moments when everybody is stressed and you're looking into the abyss. And this is where culture really makes a difference. You know, when, when everything's good, your culture doesn't really matter that much because everybody's excited and everybody's just going at it. It's very easy to be a winner. But when you're a loser, which uh, unfortunately happens more often than uh, when you're a winner, um, this is where culture really matters. Well said. How about you? Ola? Yeah. Um, the whole raft of things um, sort of pops to, um, to my mind. One thing that I would say is that we are still in very early days of Web3 and crypto and blockchain. And the reason why I'm saying this is because um, if you actually look into Web3, the only use case that has been really worked on by majority of projects is money. Mm -hmm. And various different so utilities around money and funky derivatives, this and yield farming and this and that, uh, which, you know, is probably an obvious first place to start. But there is very, very little use of Web3 technology in other sort of applications like, you know, for example, Sweatcoin and Sweat Economy, where we sort of create a completely new type of token and completely different type of utility. Mm -hmm. And the point that I want to make here is that we need more innovation outside of money markets because money markets are not going to create mass market adoption. They're not likely to bring next billion people because, to be honest, I, it's very hard to understand. For a lot of people, they don't have this liquidity required to play this uh, sort of funky and risky uh, uh, financial products. So that's one area that we are in early days. And no matter what people say, I think that you know, can, we, we have huge amount of growth ahead of us. There is a whole raft of other things that I wanted to share as a business that came from Web 2 to Web 3. Because I hope that there are quite a lot of businesses like us sitting there and kind of going, hmm, actually, you know what, maybe we should, you know, kind of go and tokenize as well. And here, I think there are several sort of pieces of advice that I would give. One is do not rely on advisors or anybody else to develop your token economics. This is like your business model. Only you will be able to come up with it. You cannot farm out the design of the sort of the most basic part of your uh, business. You know it best. Nobody will be able to do this uh, uh, this work for you. And really focus and think if you want to go into the space. Don't go into it because adding blockchain allows you to you know kind of fundraise or. You know, it, you know that is a trap because um, you know markets go up and down, and it's not necessarily going to serve you well. If you have a digital asset or something that you can tokenize, like we do with physical activity, that is inherently valuable and has not been tokenized before, and by tokenizing it, we're creating a whole new economy. We're creating an immense amount of wealth. If you're sitting on something that is not tokenized yet, 
that is not directly reflected in any asset class or in money, you know, you should be thinking about uh, uh, going to blockchain. Well, Anton, Oleg, thank you so much for being on Tasha Labs podcast today. This has been fantastic. I wish Sweatcoin and Sweat Wallet a huge success in the future. 